right, so welcome. Thank you guys for joining us this afternoon. My name is Kira Duke uh, with the Teaching with Primary Sources program at Middle Tennessee State University. Um, and today our webinar is on uh, World War II Homefront in Tennessee. Uh, we're really excited to have you guys joining us today. Um, it's going to be uh, a really special treat we've got in store for you with one of our uh, former uh, graduate assistants uh, joining us to share some work she's been doing um, over the last uh, little bit. Uh, before we get into the content for today uh, and also talking with our partner with the East Tennessee Historical Society that's uh, sponsoring this with us today, uh, let me just review a couple things. Uh, one, uh, just a few best practices. So again, um, if you are joining us via Zoom, uh, please be sure that you've got your mics muted. Uh, we are recording this and live streaming this as well um, on our Facebook page. Um, and so we'll be posting this on our YouTube uh, channel as well. And so that just helps us have a, a nice clean audio for both of those recordings. Um, also, if you're joining us uh, via Zoom, um, if you find your name in the, uh, the participant list and make sure it's showing your first and last name, and that'll just help us again as we are kind of keeping track of who's joining us so we can be sure that you're getting uh, your participation certificates and such. And it also helps us as we respond to comments throughout the session. Um, we do want today's session to be interactive. Um, so again, no matter how you're joining us, uh, feel free to use the chat functions. Uh, we will be responding uh, to questions and to comments um, throughout the session um, using that chat function. Um, and then also if you're on Zoom, uh, there are reaction buttons that you can use um, and feel free to make use of those as well. Um, and then one housekeeping thing, uh, again, we do track attendance uh, for our webinars, just like we would our in-person events. Um, so if you would, please take a moment to fill out that contact form. Um, and I hope someone has added that link into the chat box so that it's a little easier for you to access it. Um, and again, that just helps us to track who's joining us. Uh, and then Lisa will be using that uh, as well to help her on her end. So the plan for today's session uh, is we're going to be looking at a featured activity, um, Displacement and Oak Ridge, um, that's going to be presented again uh, by Colby Lane Hogan, um, who is a PhD candidate um, at MTSU and works with the Center for Historic Preservation, and uh, used to work with our Teaching with Primary Sources program a couple years ago. Um, we're also going to be spending some time talking about uh, some different resources that are available to teach about World War II and uh, specifically the home front um, and during World War II. Um, and that will be both from the Library of Congress, some things that our Teaching with Primary Sources program has, and then things that our partners um, at the East Tennessee Historical Society has as well. So before we jump into that content, though, I want to uh, take a moment to turn things over to our partner, uh, Lisa Oakley, to share a few things uh, going on at the East Tennessee Historical Society. Thanks, Kira. We're just so tickled to have everybody here with us. Um, one of these days, we'll all be here in person. And if you're ever over our way in, in Knoxville, if, if you're from the area, I hope you've had a chance to visit an, us in the past. If not, and you're visiting Knoxville, we're in downtown Knoxville, across from the Tennessee Theater. We have an incredible museum, um, and we are open to the public um, currently and um, have a lot to share. And I know that we also have a lot of teacher uh, materials. We have our website that we're going to be highlighting a few pieces of here shortly. Layla Smallwood works with me here. And we're also really working this semester to try um, to be in classrooms more frequently, virtually, but in unique ways and in engaging ways. And so um, she may hit on some of that. And we hope that if there's something you think of, especially if it's a story and you're teaching Tennessee history or you're working with something um, that you feel like that we may have some resources for. I guess that's my one thing I want to share right now is just reach out to us because um, even if it's just a, something we could record ahead of time and send to your classroom, we could feature an artifact, we could feature a portion of our permanent exhibit. Um, I think that one of the things we've realized is that virtual for us means sometimes that teachers can be leading instruction and we can help provide a resource virtually for you to use either live or recorded with us sharing information or sharing an activity, sharing a worksheet in much smaller, briefer pieces than what a visit to the museum would usually, you know, an hour and a half to two hours and a bus ride and, 
and all that. And we know that no one has that attention level right now <laughs> either, so um, virtually. So we're really interested in hearing what you have um, in mind. And so please just reach out if there's a story, if there's something you're working with in your uh, curriculum, in your classroom, and you feel like we may have a unique piece of that um, that you would like for us to share in some way. Like I said, if you if you don't have the ability to do it live in your classroom, then reach out to us. And we've, we've taken students' questions before and just recorded brief answers with artifacts to the students' questions. So, you know, let's be creative and see how we can be of the most help. And again, you're gonna meet Layla here in a little bit. She's gonna highlight some things and I'll let her follow up more on that. So as far as our student education program, um, we have folks actually talking to us, asking us about things. So this semester, it seems like that we're, we're doing some pilots and maybe even be able to get some things shared and available on our website that she's gonna highlight as well as our ETHS Facebook page. So thank you all again for joining us virtually and I hope that we'll get to see you sometime here in Knoxville and come visit the museum if you're in the area. Um, let us know how we can help and we do look forward to the day to have students in the doors again. So thank you all and hope you enjoy the rest of the webinar. Thank you, Lisa. Um, hi everyone, I'm Stacy. I am going to just introduce our guest presenter right now, um, Colby Lane Hogan. Uh, as Kira mentioned, Colby was a couple years ago, two or three years ago, the graduate research assistant for the Teaching with Primary Sources program at MTSU. So we're very familiar with Colby and she's already created a lot of great resources for teachers on our site as part of that program. Um, but she's also a PhD student in public history at MTSU and she's working on a dissertation that's examining the displacement of communities uh, for Oak Ridge during the Manhattan Project in East Tennessee. And um, I feel very privileged to be able to work with Colby on her work. Um, part of that includes a lesson plan for teachers and it's having its grand premiere today for all of you. Uh, I just uh, posted it to our TPS website today. And later on, we'll show you where you can find that when we go through resources. Um, but Colby has been very interested in Oak Ridge for a long time. In fact, she uh, created the um, Secret City lesson plan that we have on our, on our website back when she was our graduate research assistant. Uh, so you may have heard her talk about this uh, previously at a, a workshop or something, but um, so I, I'd like to give um, a, a big chunk of time so that she can share this with you and some of her research and some of the things that she's found. Now, because this is something that deals with Oak Ridge sources and is part of her dissertation, it's, it's unorthodox in terms of TPS materials and that it doesn't draw as heavily from Library of Congress primary sources. But um, we are going to show you some Library of Congress World War II homefront resources later in the program. But uh, most of the stuff that you'll see Colby talk about is, are from either archives uh, because the Library of Congress does not have <laughs> the Oak Ridge National Laboratory uh, primary sources. Anyway, that's just a disclaimer. Uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Colby. Thanks, Dr. Graham. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm glad to be here with y'all this uh, afternoon, evening. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen and we'll get started. y'all see that? Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, this lesson plan has kind of a, a lot to it. Um, and it is a long lesson plan. And I recognize that not many folks, especially now um, teaching virtually and hybrid and some in the classroom, just trying to juggle all of that. Um, would have the the time to do all of the lesson plan, but I've tried to compartmentalize it so that 
hopefully, depending on um, the age and ability and prior knowledge of your students, you can pick out something from this lesson and uh, make it useful to you. So hopefully it's uh, compartmentalized enough for you to get something out of it. Um, the topic of the lesson is displacement in Oak Ridge, like Dr. Graham said. Um, so a, a little bit of background in case uh, you are unfamiliar with the displacement that happened there. When the Manhattan Project was first established uh, in the early 1940s, there were three atomic cities that were closed cities, secret cities that were created. Um, one was Hanford, Washington that focused on plutonium that they used for the bomb at Nagasaki. Um, Los Alamos, New Mexico was where they tested the bombs and then Oak Ridge was where they handled um, research uh, about uranium and so in the enrichment of uranium. What a lot of folks don't realize is that in each of those places, um, though they were sparsely populated, they weren't vacant. They weren't, um, you know, empty in empty land sources. And so there were thousands of people, about 3,000 people who were in the Oak Ridge region that were displaced from communities like Wheat and Scarborough and Robertsville and Elsa, um, New Hope, New Bethel, all of those areas used to be part of Anderson and Rome counties that became the Oak Ridge Reservation. So we're talking about 59,000 acres. Um, and Oak Ridge is a bit unique because a lot of those people um, living in Anderson and Rome counties at the time were um, aware of and had experienced displacement because of these large scale federal projects before. Some had been displaced because of Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Some had been displaced because of um, TVA, especially Norris Dam. And so uh, when the surveyors came to create the Oak Ridge Reservation, it wasn't necessarily uh, foreign to these folks. And so for this lesson plan, the goal is to have students understand a bit more about the displaced residents um, so that they can kind of broaden their knowledge of the impact that World War II had on the home front in Tennessee. Um, there's a lot of information out there about people who uh, experienced loss and people who experienced um, connections to the war by having family members or friends overseas fighting, um, victory gardens, things like that. Um, different drives and collecting goods for the for the war effort, but um, not a whole lot of information about what happened to people who lost their land, their livelihoods, their homes, their farms um, for this effort for the Manhattan Project. So that's what this focuses on. Um, within it, uh, like I said, I compartmentalize it. So hopefully you can take something and use it in your classroom. Um, we'll go through the objectives as we go through the, the different steps, but the investigative questions, basically what I want students to get at the end of the lesson is a judgment call where they're able to take their knowledge and make an opinion about whether the federal government was justified in displacing these residents to create the secret city. And then um, hopefully using that as kind of a springboard for other discussions that are more broad, that are more applicable to um, persistent issues in history and, and um, the modern day, so uh, and contemporary issues. In what situations should national security eclipse individual and property rights? So what makes, what's a situation where it would be so important for the government to take land in order to secure um, the United States? So, um, and you'll see on this um, on these slides, I've put the uh, the picture of my actual lesson plan in the corner, so you know that this is all part of that. Um, there's nothing new on the PowerPoint; it's all linked there in the um, the lesson plan. But these curriculum standards are mostly for ninth through twelfth grade, just because of the different sources. But if you teach fifth grade or you teach um, government or another subject, um, you could definitely tweak this and, uh, and make it your own to, to fit your students. So two day lesson plan. Um, the first day, start by asking students just what they know. And that might be different depending on what you're teaching and, and how long you've 
uh, spent on World War II or the Manhattan Project and so forth. So the first um, activity for your students, I have um, excerpted part of the Tennessee Encyclopedia, which is a great source. Um, the excerpt on Oak Ridge that was written by Charles Johnson, historian at UT. Um, and he wrote this, I taught English a little bit uh, as well as history. And so I loved having my students annotate. There's directions within the lesson plan on you know, how you could get your students to annotate this. So depending on how much time you have or how much your students might already know about Oak Ridge or not, um, you could have them underline things, circle things, um, put question marks where they don't um, know a word that they need to look up. And you could go through that as a class or individually and have them do that. If you don't have time for that, I've also um, listed four questions that go along with this excerpt to, uh, would help them glean out the most important information and give them kind of a background of Oak Ridge and its importance in East Tennessee and, and the United States and the world, frankly. So oops, next, um, there's a discussion at the end of this lesson plan. And when you're having discussion, you all know how important it is to get everybody on the same page in terms of definitions. And so defining displacement as um, taking something from someone, uh, in this case, land, um, and forcing them off of it. And then eminent domain, the, um, the law that the federal government used to make this so. Um, discussing those two definitions first and then connecting them to Oak Ridge. And so how is displacement even relevant when you're talking about Oak Ridge? How is eminent domain relevant? Um, what role did those two things play in the 40s in East Tennessee. So that's just to kind of get them started. Um, this is another option if you uh, would like for your students to watch a documentary. There's a 26 documentary that was done several years, uh, years back um, at Y12. And so there's historians on there. And then there's also uh, folks who experience displacement and folks whose families experience the displacement. And this is just um, an episode of that documentary that's on YouTube, but it has a lot of um, really personal stories about uh, folks who experienced these evictions and how frequent they were and, uh, and, and what it did to that region. There's also bullet points within the lesson plan about where to stop the tape. It's a 26 minute uh, clip and so, you know how uh, students will become, you know, a little tired if you watch the whole thing at one time. So this could also be asynchronous homework if you want to have them watch this and then talk about it the next time um, you meet. And so there's some questions uh, for that documentary. So I'm kind of fast forwarding through all of this to get to the primary sources. Um, the following day, kind of recap, just to get everybody on the same page. But there is um, some introduction of primary sources. And so like Dr. Graham mentioned, these are not from the Library of Congress. They're, they're things that I have come across in my research. And I just really wanted to put them together in a way that they could be used in the classroom because I thought that they were so unique and interesting and something that when I was teaching World War II, I didn't have access to. I didn't know was out there. And so I've created a, a Venn diagram, triple Venn diagram, to analyze three different primary sources. Um, so we're going to look at the Anderson valuation, that's primary source A, and then we'll, we'll skim over just kind of show you what the other two are so we can move on. Um, but this might be a bit intimidating for your students um, when they see those blank circles, what do we write in there? There's examples of things that you can ask them to write within the um, lesson plan. So if you're doing this with your students, they would use this sheet. I'm going to ask that while we're looking at the Anderson valuation that you guys would use the chat box so that we can make this a bit more interactive. Um, and then we'll skim some more of the lesson plan. But while you're looking at the Anderson valuation, what I want you to think about, what I want you to jot down in the chat box are questions that you have about it, um, themes that pop up. Look at whose voice is being portrayed in the primary source. Um, what point of view is being used? Um, are there any 
um, significant uh, words that pop up. And so we'll just be filling out that very top Anderson valuation. When it's all said and done with your students, you would have them do this three times and then fill out the center part to kind of see what is um, similar about all three of these very different primary sources so that you can see what conclusions can be drawn from them. But we'll look at the, the primary source here. So you can see on um, the top right of the screen there is um, the, the, the handout that you would pass out to your students or put online for them. But this is a photograph of um, Jim and Studia Friels Anderson's home in Anderson County. Um, a decade or so ago, the Anderson County Historical Society funded um, a, a local man to go down to the National Archives and he um, indexed and scanned all of these documents, uh, or sorry, not documents, documents and photographs. So when the surveyors came to acquire the land needed for the Manhattan Project to build the Oak Ridge Reservation, they took a photograph of every structure, every home, barn, privy, chicken house, everything that was on that property. And then they had a valuation sheet that you can see in the, in the right there um, that went along with it. So take a minute, look at this home. Um, what do you think about it? And then we're going to flip uh, the, the slide and I'll show you that valuation sheet. So these are all available on, um, they're available at TSLA and they're available through the Anderson County Historical Society. They're on CD-ROM. So this is the other part of that primary source um, document. So if you'll look, I've just kind of um, given a brief summary on the left and I'll summarize this for you um, to save time. And then I'll give you a moment to write in the chat box what you would write in the, the, um, the Venn diagram if you were actually doing this with your students. So the Anderson's farm was 218 acres and they were given a notice um, October of 1942. That was one month after Leslie Groves was formally made a Brigadier General and put in charge of the Manhattan Project. It was a month after they formally said Oak Ridge is where we want to do this uh, project as. They were given a couple of weeks to move, which was not uncommon, and they lost a lot of money not being able to sell their cattle. Um, it's not that these folks who were displaced couldn't take their property with them, but a lot of them didn't have any place to go. If you keep reading there, um, the uh, payout for them finally from the federal government came the following year and they were paid $33 an acre for their land. They were not paid um, what they thought they deserved, nor was anybody uh, in Oak Ridge or what became Oak Ridge paid what they thought they deserved for all of the improvements that they had made on their properties. Some of these people had lived on these farms for generations. And so all of the things that farmers do to um, make their, field, their fields more fertile or um, you know, fencing and barns and things like that, a lot of that wasn't um, paid out to them. So um, when they moved, unless they had a setup, uh, a lot of them couldn't take cattle and things with them and they left them there. Um, you also have to think about what happened. This was 1942. A lot of these folks who were mostly farmers were just recovering from the Great Depression. And when 56,000 acres at first was instantaneously taken, um, it dropped, uh, or sorry, it rose the property values of the surrounding areas because all those people had to relocate. So never were there folks who were able to take the payout from their farms and purchase something that was equivalent to that when they moved. And so um, there's a lot of hardship that happened with the displaced people that's not necessarily part of the normal narrative of the home front um, that we hear about during World War II. Um, a lot of these folks were very willing to sell their properties. I should, not all of them, but a lot of them were just because they knew that 
they didn't know about the Manhattan Project, but they knew that it was uh, for the war effort and that it was supposed to be um, supporting that. And so they were more willing to, to give it up. Um, but, you know, it, it wasn't that simple. It wasn't black and, at black and white where they willingly gave it up and didn't have any hard feelings towards the government or towards what happened to them. So take a minute, look through this valuation sheet. You can see um, their property value. So for instance, that number one at the top is the dwelling. That's their home. It was valued at about $1,200, I think that says. Uh, and sorry for the grainy picture. Um, this has been scanned. These are documents that have been scanned and put on a CD and now I've taken them off. So um, take a minute though, and just jot down a bullet point or two in the chat box about what you think about this. So, Colby, one question that's come up was, you know, what was the standard for valuation um, and, and comparable properties? Is that something that you happen to run across? So, um, I'm not exactly sure. I need to look that up on how they um, went about the, the actual numbers. But these valuation sheets were to, to make it data driven as opposed to coming in and saying, oh, we're going to give. Um, this farm is going to be valued at this and this is going to be valued at that it was it was they tried to make it cut and dry and of course that's not the way that it turned out many people went to federal court and uh, and fought their valuations and uh, received more money from the federal government but a lot of people weren't um privileged enough to be connected in that way where they were able to go and fight for more um, so I don't know, in, in terms of numbers, I'm not exactly sure how they came up with, you know, this uh, mill shed was valued at $75. I'm not really sure um, if that's what you're asking. Uh, another question that came up was, uh, you know, they noted the, you know, the materials that were, or, you know, that made up each of the buildings. Um, you know, were those materials reused at all? Or, I mean, what did they do with all of the materials for the buildings that were there? As far as I know, no. Most of the farms were burned. Um, there's stories, um, people who have shared their stories via video or been, been interviewed, um, you know, after the fact, talk about how they weren't even, they didn't even turn the corner and their house, you know, their farmhouse was already burning down. Um, Basically, the federal government needed that land. They needed it quickly and they needed people off of it. Um, that's not to say that there were no buildings that were saved. There were some um, that were used, farmhouses that were used for um, housing for different um, uh, military and government officials, but that wasn't common. A lot of these houses even though TVA had been there in the region since uh, the mid thirties, most of the houses didn't have electricity. And so when um, these officials come in, it wasn't uncommon for the farmhouses, especially the ones that didn't have electricity, which was most of them to be, you know, to be demolished pretty quickly after the fact. Uh, and one other question, uh, someone asked a question about what the, the final column there on the right, what that column was representative of? <laughs> that is a really great question. Um, I still have not figured that out. If you count all that up, that is $375 for the Sanderson valuation. They were paid $4,000, which is the value price. So that second to the last one on the right. Um, I'm not sure. And I've looked at a ton of these and I, I don't know uh, exactly what that is. I don't know if that's if it was sold alone, um, I'm not really sure. But it doesn't, that last column doesn't seem to correlate with what the families were paid. Um, another question, Colby, real quick. Uh, did General Groves have a specific budget that determined the amounts that they were able to offer these people? I don't know how involved necessarily um, General Groves was in doing this so uh, in, in taking the land so when they sent the surveyors out they were from the Ohio River Division of the Army Corps of Engineer um, 
General Groves was really involved in choosing the site and then building um, the plants and, and moving people in. So he was more with Stone and Webster and uh, the engineers who were coming in after the fact. So um, again, sorry, I don't have like a, a great answer for that, but I don't know that he was super involved with the displacement. I think that was kind of handled and then he was there to do the new stuff. All right. So many questions. Okay, I can't see the chat box. <laughs> so if y'all oh, no, 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 we're reading them too. Else. I'm just okay. saying there's so many things that you can talk about with this. Um, and plus there's a lot of uh, parallels to other cases of, you know, eminent domain and dispossession. Um, you know, Chris was talking about uh, a road project in the 1980s even so at where you have no choice I mean I know you mentioned that some people went to court uh, but really they still had to leave you know the court would only determine like how much money they get not whether they have to leave or not right so that's that's yeah yeah there and um, there are several interviews that I've watched where, you know, and they, it's sad, this isn't funny at all, but they kind of shrug their shoulders and say, well, we just figured it was the government coming in. They did this every decade um, when the folks were coming. And it's just, if you, if you think about that and the impact that these federal projects have had, projects have had specifically in that region of East Tennessee, it's, you know, it's heartbreaking to think that these people have continually been, um, you don't want to say targeted, but that region has been the subject of so much displacement there. So, okay. Uh, um, sorry, one last question. Do you know of these people, the Andersons, if they challenged this in court? Um, I'm not sure. Um, if whoever asked that question, uh, I'm happy to find that out and email them. Um, I've got documents where I can look that up. <laughs> so I'm not positive, but- We'll, um, we'll have Layla email you. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, again, I can't see the chat box, but if you guys are good going on, we'll move on to the second and third primary sources. Okay. All right. Um, so if you are doing this as asynchronous or if you have folks in your class who are particularly interested or um, you have extra time or um, trying to keep students busy while other folks are doing something, um, at the bottom of the handout or the the document um, for this particular primary source. That bottom link is a link to um, my Weebly page. Um, a couple of classmates and I made this website and we overlaid the Army Corps of Engineer maps that they made from the Oak Ridge Reservation with those pictures from the National Archives and tried to put in family history. Um, so it's kind of neat to, it's, it's definitely not a complete project, but if your students are curious about this and they want to see more evaluation sheets, more photographs, they can go on that kind of click through this website. So that's there. It's not really part of the lesson plan, but just kind of a, an add on. Okay. So back to this primary source sheet, your students should have that top part filled out. And then now I'm going to show you the second primary source. And again, I'm going to go through this real quick. We're not going to um, discuss it unless you'll have questions and then Somebody holler at me because, again, I can't see the chat box. But um, primary source B is a letter from the, the Army Corps of Engineer to Parley Ravy. Her name is misspelled in the letter. Um, but this is a letter of taking. And so it informs her that, you know, they're going to come and take possession of their farms. So this was a very common letter um, that people in the region received. Um, something that's interesting is that if, you were a tenant, um, didn't own your land, you were a tenant farmer or a sharecropper, um, you were supposed to give that letter to the property owner. So there's this whole other, uh, whole other dy dynamic where you're not thinking about like, okay, these people are dispossessed and they get at least a little bit of money, maybe not for another year, but at least they're paid something for this. But a lot of people in the region were tenant farmers at the time and they're just out of luck. They just have to move and there's no... Um, there's no safety net for them. So it was different than TVA uh, being able to, to help the dispossessed a bit more. The next one um, is kind of an interesting source. This is a poem 
Um, and it's written by a resident of Robertsville, one of the displaced communities. His name's Kurt Hendricks, and he moves to Union County, and he writes this, um, this poem about what he thinks about um, Oak Ridge, and he doesn't call it, um, well, he says they call it Oak Ridge now in the poem, but um, he, he writes what he thinks about uh, it, and so it's just kind of a different perspective, a very personal perspective from someone who had it happen to them. So after your students have looked at those primary sources, um, then kind of filling it back in and seeing those are three very different documents, but what do they have in common? What can you draw out of that that would give you a bit more understanding of displaced residents uh, in those communities? Okay. After they've looked at these primary documents, there is a discussion prompt um, that is available for students. This is for um, after they have knowledge, but before you have a class discussion about it. And so it's uh, in hopes that you'll have a, a more um, vibrant conversation, uh, giving students kind of an, an opportunity to think about things on their own and write it down before they talk about it. So before you give them the discussion prompt, I would like for you to share a little bit, um, some, some little tidbits about the project, uh, about Oak Ridge, um, so that they will kind of be a bit more historically accurate, because again, they kind of had a lot thrown at them in this lesson plan or, or portions of it that you might use. So things for students to keep in mind before they get this writing prompt. Neither the Army Corps of Engineer surveyors, people who worked at Oak Ridge, or the landowners that are displaced really know anything about the atomic bomb. There's about 75,000 people who eventually during World War II are going to make the Oak Ridge Reservation um, their place of residence as they're working on the project, but very, very, very few of them actually understand um, what they're working on. And so that's important to note. Um, a lot of these families, again, like we said before, had been displaced before. Um, this was not the first time, Oak Ridge was not the first time. For some of them it was, but for several of them it was not. Um, and then lastly, regardless of the type uh, or historical perspective that your student chooses, the final project, um, your final writing should answer typical investigative questions. So hopefully that kind of narrows down what their writing should look like and what you expect. So um, if I were assigning this, I would want to be able to read their writing and say, okay, who is it about? What is it about? When, where, how, how why, all of that. Um, so the next slide is the actual prompt that you would give to them. So it says um, there's 75,000 people in Oak Ridge, 3,000 people about our um, former residents. That was about 1,000 families who were displaced. And um, there are loads of opinions about this place. So choose a historical perspective to emulate and create an opinion piece about the city's creation. There are several examples, you'll see them on the right there, um, ex examples of historical perspectives and examples of writing top uh, types that they can choose um, just to give your students a bit of um, uh, choice. And again, you could change this and make it however you wanted. But um, some of the historical examples that I've just come up with, um, they could pretend to be a farmer from Robertsville, a Scarborough merchant, um, a student at Wheat High School. Wheat was one of the prominent um, communities that was in Oak Ridge, and people would come from all over to go to school in Wheat. There was a college and a high school that were um, that were, were really great schools. Um, so they could be a student at Wheat. They could be a young person um, who moved to Oak Ridge to work, or a displaced person who eventually got a job and a steady paycheck um, from staying in Oak Ridge. So lots of historical perspectives that your students could choose. Um, and then writing types. They could write a letter to a family member in a neighboring county, a note to one of their friends serving overseas, um, a letter to the senator or the governor. Um, they could write a poem. Um, there's also an option for them to create a, a brainstorming web or an outline of what their family might do, uh, future plans. So they know that they're being displaced. Where, you know, what are their next steps? 
Um, so there's a lot of options there. If that's too much for your students, then you know, feel free to narrow it down or nix it. But um, I always like to have a writing prompt before they're expected to participate in a discussion. So last thing is to facilitate a class discussion about displacement and about eminent domain. And so again, go back to that investigative question. Considering all of this that happened during the World War II, uh, on the home front during World War II, um, was the impact worth it? And so, um, you know, there were a lot of people who were um, hurt by the displacement um, that, you know, never fully recovered uh, economically, financially, um, you know, land-wise, all of that. So think about the long-term impact in the state and region. There's a lot of different questions in here that you could ask your students, but um, hopefully at the end of it, you can get back to that question that goes beyond just Oak Ridge and is more applicable to other topics, which is what situation should national security eclipse individual and property rights? Was this okay? Was it justified? What do you think and why? Um, and hopefully you'll have a vibrant discussion with that. Um, there's evaluation numbers at the bottom, like there are, there always are on uh, TPS lesson plans. And then the very last thing, the extension activity. Um, if you don't know what you might, um, there's a K-25 museum that just opened up. They tore down the K-25 building, of course, but they have the museum. It's open. Um, it opened in March and then it quickly closed after that due to COVID. Um, so I'm not exactly sure when that is reopening. Some of you probably know better than me on that. Um, but there is a virtual museum. Um, and so the website is there uh, for, for students to go to for an extension activity. But um, again, that was a lot, but hopefully uh, parts of it will be uh, helpful and something that you guys can use. Thank you so much, Colby. That is just a fascinating topic. Um, I could tell from the, uh, the conversations going on in chat. Uh, there's so many more things I'm sure that we'd like to pick your brains about, uh, but uh, hopefully everyone will um, be able to get something out of that lesson plan. Um, for your own interests, if not for something you can use in the classroom. Uh, but we're gonna show you uh, in the, few minutes remaining, some additional resources, just kind of um, not Oak Ridge specific like that lesson plan, but uh, on the topic of teaching World War II, particularly the home front experience of World War II. And so I am going to share my screen and okay, so I'm just going to show you some uh, websites available or web pages available through the Library of Congress website. Um, and okay, this is our website, the TPS one, but I just wanted to show you uh, the what's new. There's the lesson plan that Colby just talked about. And it also lives under um, the US history under the World War II tab. Uh, I put it right underneath Colby's earlier lesson plan on choosing the secret city. Uh, which is also pretty cool. Um, okay, now as far as oh, the home front during World War II, the Library of Congress, of course, has a lot of great stuff about Japanese American internment. Um, there is a lesson plan from their teachers page. They also have a primary source set on their teachers page about this. There's a whole collection of photographs by Ansel Adams that uh, these materials draw on. That's all through the Library of Congress. Um, they also have, uh, through their presentations tab on their teachers page, um, this US history primary source timeline, which has a chapter on the Great Depression and World War II. And if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see the World War II section right here. And um, they say documents, uh, but a lot of this stuff is photographs. Um, so I don't know if this was meant to replace the American Memory Timeline or not, which was an old part of their website that was a lot more document driven. I missed that part, but they, they update all the time. So this is what they have now. And I think that they updated the materials as well. Um, oh, hold on, I can't switch my tabs because of the bar. Okay, there we go. 
Um, there's also a web guide on World War II materials at the Library of Congress, which is a really great table of contents for getting you there. It's annotated so you can kind of read, oh, okay, maybe that one looks good. Uh, so they have these different collections, um, the exhibitions, which are otherwise kind of hard to search through. So here they have the ones right here. Um, they have uh, the Today in History uh, entries that talk about World War II. So that's a really great index of those right here. And then um, some external websites as well. So this web guide is uh, really well done. It's kind of hard to get to, so I'll show you an easier way to get to it in a minute. They also have a research guide on Rosie the Riveter, Working Women and World War II. And of course, the Rosie the Riveter story is a wonderful way to talk about the home front in the United States during World War II, especially as it touches on Tennessee history, because a lot of the images of the Rosie the Riveters are from uh, Nashville. Uh, they were building um, bomber airplanes. And so uh, this, is, this is a really good kind of research guide. Um, they have all these different tabs, you know, what are the videos, where can you find the primary sources, um, and just other kinds of things as well. And let's see, the Veterans History Project is, unless you're looking for a specific name of a specific veteran, it's kind of hard to browse. Since you can't just go there and click on World War II and find all their World War II stuff. But they do have this um, little page here about the World War II home front where they highlight specific stories on that theme. Uh, and here it is. And of course, again, I'm gonna show you an easier way to get to this in just a moment. Um, we love the WPA posters. <laughs> uh, I know this is more of a New Deal topic, but a lot of these posters are messages to people at home during World War II to, um, you know, this is where the loose lips sink ships and, you know, uh, salvage your metal for scrap to help the war effort. And a lot of that kind of public propaganda um, to assist the war effort, you're going to find uh, graphic illustrations of that in this collection here. Um, I also want to point out a non-Library of Congress uh, page. This is through the Albert Gore Research Center, which is the University Archives at MTSU, where we work. Um, they have a whole collection called Tennesseans and World War II. And we actually, several years ago, we had a workshop with them at the Gore Center where they brought out some of their stuff on this. So if any of you were at that workshop, then you may be familiar with this already. But you can browse all of their stuff online through this link. And you can see it's a lot of great things because there were a lot of maneuvers like uh, in Tennessee uh, in you know preparing for the war. And there are a lot of photographs of those operations that are available here. Um, so what I did was I compiled this um, resources guide, which is just basically here are all the links that I just showed you. But instead of having to find them in awkward roundabout ways on the Library of Congress website, I just popped them all into this bullet point list. So this is available through our TPS Google uh, Drive. Um, Kira, is there a way that you can drop this link in? Or I can probably do that too. Um, yeah, we can get it in there. OK, I have made this link available to anyone with a link, so you shouldn't have to get permission in order to access it. But if you do have problems, just email either myself or Kira, and we'll just send it straight to you, no big deal. Um, so that's what I wanted to show you. And now I'm going to turn it over to Kira. Oops, stop sharing. All right, sorry, I didn't quite get to where I could get to the link yet, so that's not in the chat Wait, box. Let me yet. see. I think that'll do yeah, it. There it is. All right, let me I'm gonna share my screen for just a second. So um, I'm gonna show you guys a couple different things that we have from our um, Teaching with Primary Sources website. And let's see, okay. So one that uh, Stacy just mentioned, some, oh wait, wrong tab, here we go. Um, of course, are our lesson plans. Uh, and so if you notice there on the tab, uh, US History Reconstruction to Modern America, there's actually a tab that's just World War II. 
Uh, and so some of the lesson plans that we have here um, dealing uh, with this time period, there's one on African-American involvement in World War II. Uh, there is another one on oral histories and historical memory. Uh, and so, you know, Stacy mentioned the Veterans History Project. There are some wonderful, wonderful sources in that collection. But like she mentioned, it can be a little difficult to kind of narrow things down to find the source or the excerpt of a source that you would want to use with your students. Um, so this is a lesson plan that you can make use of. It's got some of that already narrowed down for you. Um, we also have a lesson plan on the Double V campaign. Um, so one story that you can bring into this to kind of help uh, your students kind of bridge as you're going in from World War II into kind of the civil rights era uh, is talking about the Double V campaign. And that is where um, you had um, civil rights activists and specifically, um, you know, soldiers, um, African soldiers who were uh, thinking of why are we fighting fascism at home and we should also be addressing some of the issues that we have uh, going on uh, at home as well as what's happening abroad. And so this looks at uh, that campaign to kind of tie together the, the causes of the war with what was happening with civil rights at home. Uh, and so this is a really interesting lesson plan that again is a good way to kind of bridge that, uh, that unit as you go from World War II into civil rights. Um, another lesson plan that we have uh, on uh, Oak Ridge is choosing the secret city. And so again, this is kind of telling that other side of the story. Again, kind of like why the, the, uh, the process to choose the area and then kind of the perspective of, of those coming in to work and build, uh, to work and, and build the site. Uh, and again, uses some of the oral histories in the Veterans History Project. And then uh, we have a project uh, or a lesson plan that was done by a teacher that we work with some in Memphis um, on the atomic bomb. Uh, and so this is a really, um, the way this design is a huge kind of group project, uh, having students do some research and actually present their findings uh, like they would a newscast. Uh, and so again, if that's something that you're doing kind of group project wise, uh, this has got a really nice setup and a lot of instructions uh, and, and uh, supports for doing that kind of project. Now, uh, we have a couple of other things that I want to show you. Uh, one is a newsletter that we did in November 2018. And so you could go to our newsletters page um, to find this. Um, and it is on uh, World War II. And so you'll see some of the sources uh, and things that Stacy mentioned and some of the previous lesson plans. Um, and so there's a couple different uh, things here. We have a lesson idea on reactions to the day of infamy, uh, which is kind of a man on the street type interview collection that the library has. Uh, another thing on soldiers experiences, uh, women's impact on the war effort. And then there is a link here and I need to go back and, and double check to see if this video is still at the same link because I know the uh, organization we partnered with at the university has been changing their website some, uh, but we did, uh, an event uh, back in 2017 um, and we had Dr. Amy Sayward come in and do a lecture and she did it on the Battle of the Stomach spirit in World War II. It was a really fascinating lecture uh, about the you know hunger and just the the role of kind of supplying food for people uh, and how central that was to the war effort. Um, and so this was a really great lecture um, and she's such a fabulous speaker. So again, we'll double check this link is working um, but this is a really cool lecture. It's about an hour long. Um, so that's that's a really cool resource that we have. Um, there is uh, this kind of comic book piece that they did. Uh, the library has up and it's about a female photographer, photo photographer um, who was actually working uh, in the European theater um, during World War II. Uh, and then a couple of other sources there. And of course, there's some great political cartoons that you can find in the library's collections uh, for that period as well. And then the other thing that I wanted to bring your attention to is a primary source set that we have on our TPS site uh, for World War II. And again, some other you know, great links that are here, uh, some that we've mentioned already. Uh, but there's just a nice kind of collection of sources um, that you could use um, you know, with your students. Uh, you have everything from the like, newspaper collection. So here we've got a little um, you know, piece about the quarantine speech that Roosevelt gave. Uh, there is uh, some images uh, and documents related to the Holocaust. Uh, there are things about Pearl Harbor. Uh, this is a really uh, interesting source, uh, losses by the Japanese fleet. Uh, and so again, it kind of gives you a, a little bit of a visual there. Uh, more sources for kind of talking about women's uh, impact on the war effort. 
um, African Americans uh, and their contributions. Um, and then of course you'll find the citations guide there at the end. So that's just a few things that we have. Uh, we of course also have uh, a grade level resource guide that's got one page of things related to World War II. And then we will be developing uh, a piece that goes along with our These Truths chapter guides uh, that Layla has been working on that'll be up uh, here in probably the next month or so that we'll have a chapter on World War II and we'll have some other things too. So uh, again, that's just a few things, but it helps narrow down and give you kind of an idea of what you can find on our TPS site. So I'm going to turn things over to Layla to share some things that the East Tennessee Historical Society has. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Cool. I'm using my AirPods, so sometimes it's hit or miss. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you. Um, so I'm just going to show, um, share a few things with you guys that we have available on the East Tennessee Historical Society's education page. It's teachtnhistory.org. That's the website. If you type it in, it'll come up for you really quickly. Um, so I just wanted to share our curriculum materials first. Uh, you see they're like, they're organized in chronological order. So you can go and pick out what you want. Uh, I'll be sharing something on World War II with you guys today. Um, so these curriculum materials are linked here. And then I wanted to show you guys specifically this Oak Ridge in the Manhattan Project. This is um, a packet. So it includes a content essay, which is really great, especially for teachers. I remember sometimes I'd be teaching something and have to go back and refresh my memory a little bit. So these content essays are great for that. And they're also great for students if you want to distribute these things out to students or jigsaw it in a certain way and chunk it up for them. So really fantastic resource there. Uh, again, they're like two to three pages max. And then we have some resources there for further investigation. And these also include lesson activities for your students. So there's an elementary and then a middle school and high school lesson activity. And this one starts with FDR approaching a Tennessee Senator and talking about um, Oak Ridge, where can we put this secret city? And you have to make these connections after reading the content essay and figure out what happens between this discussion and when the bombings in Japan happen. So we're looking at how this bomb is developed and how Tennessee really plays a role in this home front uh, war effort. So again, there are teacher versions here, of course, answers will vary, but it kind of gives you something to model for students. And we have an elementary and a high school and middle school version of this. So the high school version is a little bit more in depth in this way. And I'll scroll down a little bit more for you. And then we have these source sets here. So these are great. Sometimes they have photographs, sometimes they have documents or posters. So different pieces to get your students involved. I love doing something like this in the beginning, like a primary source analysis with an image or a document kind of getting everybody into the right mindset. So we have, I think, four of these types of things available for World War II on the Teach Teen History page. Um, yeah, so four content essays with primary source sets and student activities. We also have here linked other additional resources. And I really want to share this with you guys because it's one of my favorite pieces on our additional web uh, resources World War II section of our website. And these are primary source um, propaganda posters that you can use and share with your students. Again, some of these are not uh, appropriate for younger students. You're going to have to provide a lot of historical context for older students if you use these as well. But I, I love using propaganda posters and pictures, and these would be a great way to teach the war effort um, and war home front in Tennessee and just uh, nationally as well. So a lot of great resources here. And again, that's on our um, additional resources page right here for the World War II tab. And then the other thing I wanted to share with you guys are our artifact lessons. These are fantastic. These are linked directly to our artifacts in the museum and they're all available in PDF format and they're sectioned out by time period. So I'm gonna show you guys the 20th century Tennessee. This is like 1900 to 1960s, that kind of time period. Um, so we have these different pieces that we have in the museum. We also have pieces on TVA, um, this artifact card get students to identify what the TVA is and have some images from our um, gallery there. And then we have a piece here on, um, trying to find it, the Manhattan Project, there it is. Um, so we have a piece here as well and you can introduce this to students, introduce these terms to them and get them to discuss what they already know, just pieces like that. So this set is for 20th century Tennessee. Um, and we have a ton of different prompts, 
different questions you can use. And a few of these are directly for Tennessee Homefront, Oak Ridge, Manhattan Project, things like that. And these are available on our Artifact Lessons tab. You just go there and you'll see they are chunked out. And then we also have a teacher's guide here for you to use when using your Artifact cards. So those are all available and free on the ETHS Teach TN History page. Um, and then I also wanted to share our education Facebook page with you because we will be sharing resources that are World War II related over the next few months as we create virtual programming. Um, we are working to create programming for um, virtual field trips for students because if they can't be with us in person, we'd love to create content for teachers and students virtually. Um, and I do just want to say, as you're checking out our Facebook, if you see something in you or our website as well, if you see something you want some more information, whether it's Oak Ridge related or anything East Tennessee history related, please just reach out to us. We're happy to point you in the right directions and figure out how we can help you put this content in your classroom, whether it's with us or with another local partner. Um, and I am going to stop sharing now and turn it back over. Lisa wanted to say a few things. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Lisa. I know we're just about out of time, but I put a link in the chat box for a National History Day, National Gold Medal documentary on eminent domain. Um, and it's a story out of Jefferson County, Tennessee. And it's actually three generations of stories of um, eminent domain and how it affects one family. So I really encourage you, this is season for National History Day. We're the coordinators for the East Tennessee Regional Competition. And if you even just go to the nhd.org website, they have sample projects that have been winners at the national level. And we may even have some projects too. There's nothing like sharing, um, and none of them are over 10 minutes, whether it's a performance or a documentary. That might be a really nice way to um, get the kids interested if it's student work that you're sharing. Um, and all these students are doing really incredible work and oftentimes they're using local stories or local people to where they are from. And so it makes it very personal too. So I'll just throw National History Day in there, but please, I hope if you're interested in that um, documentary, the link's there or you can email us and I can, I can get you that link later. So anyway, but thank you all so much for being with us and Kira, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh... Let me find my, all right, here we are. Let's find the right screen to share here. So we are at the fun part of our webinar where we get to give away a book. Uh, and so at this time, uh, Stacey, what is the title for the book we're giving away today? Uh, this is a book called, Why Won't You Just Tell Us the Answer? Teaching Historical Thinking in Grades 7 through 12 by Bruce Lesh. And it's not a new title. I've actually been using it for years teaching uh, my course on historical thinking to MTSU students and they like it. So, you know. So October is gonna jump on here and share her screen and bring up our giveaway wheel to see who wins our door prize today. Yes, ma'am, let me just share my screen. And I think everyone's name is on here. There's 20 names, which is how many participants we have. So hopefully that's all correct. And we'll just go ahead and give it a spin. All right, Wes Smith is our winner today. Wes, if you will just shoot us your mailing address um, there in the chat box, or you can send it as a private message to myself. We'll get that in the mail to you. Um, as always, we really appreciate folks for um, joining us and spending a little bit of time with us. We know that it's, you know, this happened at the end of long school days and, you know, how stressful that can be. So again, we really do appreciate your time. Um, so one last thing as we're getting ready to wrap up, uh, of course, be sure that you have filled out that contact sheet that I shared at the beginning. Um, that is important for us both to be able to track and, and do our reporting for the Library of Congress to support our funding, um, but also is how Lisa will send out stipends for those of you who have participated with us live today. Um, also, if you would like to get a participation certificate, uh, we're going to need you to fill out the short survey here at this link. Um, and if you are watching this um, later on, uh, on our YouTube channel, you can, of course, still fill out this survey link in order to get participation uh, 
a, a, a PD certificate for your time spent watching and participating in today's webinar. Um, this is our first webinar for 2021. Uh, we are going to be offering um, several more coming up, uh, including uh, next week, uh, we'll be doing our digging in uh, episode for the month. And our topic for this month is teaching Black History Month. Uh, so if you would like to join us for that, um, definitely uh, just let me know. We'll get you added to the list. Uh, we also have the next in our series with our Discover Tennessee History Partnership uh, and Tennessee State Parks is going to be presenting this month. That is on Tuesday at four. And they're going to be talking about some of their parks uh, that are uh, dealing with the New Deal and some of their New Deal resources. Um, and then our next activity with uh, the East Tennessee Historical Society will be in March. And let's see, what is the date for that right off? It is March 18th. Um, and that is a peer to peer. And so this is a chance uh, this month we're going to be looking at um, just your questions. So if you have questions that you would like to pose to us, you know, content questions, questions about how to find sources related to a specific topic, um, that is a chance um, to really kind of ask those questions and kind of dig into some things that are, again, you know, of interest to you. Um, so you can send us those questions in advance just by emailing me or emailing Lisa. Um, and you can we'll sign up for that session uh, by emailing Lisa. Again, thank you guys so much for spending some time with us. Uh, I'm going to stop our recording and then uh, we'll be around if you happen to have any questions. So again, thank you guys so much for joining us today.